federal government, both on the Hill as a Senate staffer and later as a consultant. I now yield to Ranking Member Lawson to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Derek Owens, Senior Vice President of Government and, and Interest of FAIL at WTA. Advocates for rural broadband. Proud to join in WTA. He worked at the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, National Telecommunication Information Administration. Ms. Owen has a master's degree in public policy from the University of Maryland School of Public uh, Policy and received his bachelor's degree in political science from Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome, Mr. Owens, uh, to the committee. Thank you. Before the witnesses start their testimony, I would like to yield to Mr. Schneider, who is with us. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, and thank you for joining us today uh, to the witness. Uh, this is an important hearing today is a powerful tool for both consumers and entrepreneurs. The Internet services, Internet serves small businesses in a multi multitude of ways. Unfortunately, 34 million Americans still lack access to high-speed Internet, of which 39 percent live in our rural communities, compared to just 4 percent of those in urban communities. With more than 3.2 billion people online worldwide, Internet use has increased almost sevenfold in the last 15 years. However, for small firms in rural areas, a lack of broadband access to, too often means trouble attracting new businesses, creating jobs, or breaking into new markets. Time and again, we've seen how the Internet can connect companies large and small with new markets and new customers, something especially important for small, rural small businesses. The Internet has helped small businesses across the country grow, and we want to ensure that rural small businesses are not left behind due to poor connectivity or an unreliable network. This is why we must support the expansion of broadband infrastructure in rural areas. All of America's entrepreneurs deserve a level playing field regardless of where they are based. Today we will hear more about how we can help small businesses connect to high-speed Internet. On that note, I want to thank today's witnesses for being here, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. Ms. Fitzgerald, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Radewagen and Blum, Ranking Members Lawson and Schneider, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Erin Fitzgerald, Regulatory Counsel for RWA, which represents wireless carriers with fewer than 100,000 subscribers. Our members are passionate about ensuring that rural America is not left behind. RWA members operate in areas where low population density, extreme weather conditions, and difficult terrain make doing so an expensive and challenging task. Insufficient spectrum access, a dysfunctional data roaming market, and declining universal service support exacerbate these challenges. Nevertheless, networks operated by small, rural-based wireless service providers promote public safety and encourage innovation and economic development each and every day. I want to start by briefly discussing Mobility Fund Phase 2, the Universal Service Fund program designed to support mobile broadband network deployment and maintenance in areas where there isn't a business case for unsubsidized coverage. At top of mind for RWA members is the Commission's recently released initial eligible areas map. RWA is concerned that the Commission's process has failed to yield an accurate picture of mobile wireless service throughout the country. Issues regarding a too low support budget, an onerous challenge process, and costs imposed by letter of credit requirements are also cause for concern. I'd like to talk a bit about some of the business issues at play in the marketplace. Rural carriers make every effort to offer robust coverage throughout their entire service area unlike larger carriers, which tend to focus coverage on towns and major highways. The decision to offer robust coverage results in additional capital expenses in the form of more network equipment, towers, and backhaul facilities. Operational expenses are higher as well, and small carriers typically pay higher per unit prices for the latest and greatest mobile devices because they are seldom offered volume discounts. Unlike nationwide providers, small rural carriers are not able to average the cost of their rural sites with more return on investment friendly urban and suburban sites. I'd like to turn your attention now to Spectrum. Spectrum access promotes marketplace competition and Section 309J of the Communications Act requires the FCC to ensure that Spectrum is available to rural telephone companies and small businesses. When designing future Spectrum auctions, the FCC should ensure that it uses appropriately sized geographic licenses and bidding credits that will encourage auction participation by small providers. The secondary spectrum market is frequently touted as a silver bullet to address small and rural carrier spectrum needs. 
but leasing and partitioning do not provide small and rural entities with the spectrum needed for targeted local deployments. In fact, the secondary market works for consolidating spectrum in the hands of a few rather than dispersing spectrum among many. In order to keep spectrum in rural areas from lying fallow, RWA supports a keep what you serve approach to spectrum licensing, where if a licensee is not providing service to 90% of its geographic license area after a five year post renewal period, any unserved area should be made available for relicensing to providers who wish to serve it. This approach provides an incentive for existing licensees to continue to invest in market build out and also promotes the rapid deployment of wireless services in rural America. Roaming issues are also of serious concern to RWA's members. The country's nationwide carriers often refrain from offering their own subscribers roaming on small carrier networks, even when their own coverage is inferior or non-existent. While the FCC's roaming rules allow this practice, it is harmful to American consumers who are unable to access rural networks, networks those same consumers have supported through contributions into the Universal Service Fund. Further, this practice could threaten public safety. In the event of debilitating failure of one carrier, an untold number of consumers, including frontline public safety users, would be unable to communicate without bilateral roaming in place. Another problem lurking is the issue of VOLTI roaming. VOLTI, which stands for Voice Over LTE, is the ability to make telephone call over a 4G LTE network. Nearly all the na nation's mobile carriers are using 4G LTE networks. The country's nationwide carriers are also actively shutting down their circuit switch 2G and 3G networks. What will happen when all mobile wireless carriers are LTE only and no longer use circuit switch networks to complete voice telephone calls? Will rural consumers be unable to place a simple telephone call because large carriers refuse to enter into Volte roaming agreements? There is anecdotal evidence to suggest that this is happening now, and action must be taken before 2G and 3G networks are shut down to make sure that all wireless consumers in America can make Volte voice calls when roaming. As I discussed earlier, universal service support is tremendously important to rural broadband network deployment and maintenance. The FCC is preparing to hold two reverse auctions for universal service fund support. Before a, bidding, a winning bidder can receive support, it must obtain an irrevocable standby letter of credit. RWA and its members are concerned that obtaining the necessary letter of credit will be a burdensome and costly process. RWA has worked with the National Association of Surety Bond Producers and the Surety and Fidelity Association of America to explore the possibility of utilizing surety bonds as an alternative. Also, RWA has suggested that the FCC eliminate its LOC requirement entirely. The FCC has all the security it needs with respect to commission licenses, the threat of revocation or non-renewal of a license should a universal service recipient commit any misconduct. On behalf of RWA, your interest in the challenges facing rural wireless carriers is greatly appreciated. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Mr. Donovan, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Radewagen, Ranking Member Lawson, Chairman Blum, Ranking Member Schneider, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify on rural broadband and the business case for small carriers. I'm here on behalf of CCA, representing nearly 100 wireless carriers, as well as the companies that make up the wireless ecosystem. The vast majority of CCA's members are small businesses who employ the same consumers that live and work in their communities. Since I testified before your committee last June, the Rural Prosperity Task Force has found that e-connectivity is essential, and the administration, Congress, and the FCC have all proposed steps to support the business case to close the digital divide. This committee's hearing just a few weeks ago on restoring rural America underscored the importance of rural broadband access, and today we will talk about policies to make that happen. Mobile broadband use continues to increase exponentially. In 2016, Americans consumed 1.8 exabytes of data per month using wireless connections. That is 1.8 billion gigabytes, or put another way, more than 7,000 times the total of all information stored in the Library of Congress each month and data use will grow another five times over the next five years. This staggering data consumption reflects the ways that mobile broadband powers every aspect of life, from jobs and economic growth to public health and safety. Amidst talk of infrastructure for the next century, including broadband, areas without mobile coverage cannot be left behind. Tech companies recently announced plans to deploy 4G mobile broadband on the moon, yet too many in rural America are unserved or underserved, despite millions invested by CCA members in their communities. With my full statement in the record, I'd like to focus on three key issues that directly impact small carriers. First, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Reliable coverage data is critical to determine where funding should flow, 
including the FCC's $4.5 billion for Mobility Fund Phase Two through the Universal Service Fund, and any new funding made available by Congress to improve infrastructure. While progress has been made since we discussed this issue last year, the underlying map for areas deemed initially eligible for Mobility Fund Two support, released just last week, could prevent your districts from being eligible for support dollars. The updated data should have reduced overstated coverage and allow carriers to challenge claim service in those areas. It is now clear that the parameters selected by the FCC were not sufficient to produce a map that reflects the experience you have as you travel your districts. This is an acute problem for small carriers who do not have the time and resources to drive test vast geographic areas. Any areas that are presumed to be served and are not challenged, regardless of the consumer experience on the ground, will not be eligible for a decade of USF support. Second, rural areas suffer when small carriers must navigate a regulatory maze to deploy infrastructure. Application review delays, burdensome fees, and redundant studies increase uncertainty and make it more expensive to upgrade and expand service. And while technology has evolved, these rules have not. Today, the same review process applies to deploy a small cell the size of a backpack as it does to build a tall tower. Congress has dozens of bills pending, including bills sponsored by members of this committee to streamline deployment, and CCA urges swift action. This hearing is timely, as last week the FCC announced that it will vote on March 22nd to make sure the U.S. is 5G ready. This is important, not only for the future, but for deployments of all base stations, technologies, and sizes today. To be clear, carriers are deploying small cells in urban and rural areas alike. In fact, today, FCC Commissioner Carr is in Edinburgh, Virginia, a town with no stoplights, viewing the economic benefits of smaller scale network deployments in a rural area with CCA member Chantel. Third and finally, small carriers must access the resources all carriers need to provide service. This includes invisible resources like spectrum. Carriers need greater access to spectrum at high, mid, and low bands. Congress can support small carriers in this regard by first, enacting the Spectrum Auction Deposits Act to eliminate a roadblock currently preventing the FCC from holding any Spectrum auctions. Second, keeping the 600 megahertz incentive auction repack on time so that carriers can use this Spectrum to serve consumers. And third, ensuring that all carriers can access Spectrum in higher frequency bands. The largest two carriers have a head start in these Spectrum bands, and to catch up, Congress must push for rapid auction of all bands ready for wireless use. Beyond spectrum, carriers must also have reasonable access to equipment, both for their networks and the devices consumers demand. This is not only a competitive issue, but a lack of access to devices and equipment can make it harder or impossible to follow regulatory mandates premised on the latest technology. Bottom line, this issue disproportionately affects small carriers who lack the economies of scale enjoyed by the largest companies. Policies established by Congress and implemented by the FCC determine whether small businesses in rural America have access to the latest services or are left behind the modern mobile economy. Competitive carriers want to be part of the solution. Thank you again for holding today's hearing, and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. Carliner, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Bradigan, Chairman Blum, Ranking Member Lawson, and Ranking Member Schneider. I'm Paul Carliner, co-founder and CEO of BlueSurf, and I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. BlueSurf is a rural high-speed internet service provider headquartered in Salisbury, Maryland. Our company was founded in 2009 with the goal of providing affordable and sustainable high-speed internet service on the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland. We provide services to homes, businesses, schools, hospitals, even to residents living on an island in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay. In 2010, our company was awarded $3.2 million by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service to build a new state-of-the-art fixed wireless LTE network covering approximately 100,000 households across three rural Maryland counties on the Lower Eastern Shore. I want to thank the Rural Utility Service, the telecommunication program, particularly Mr. Ken Kuchno and Mr. Rick Gordon, who were so instrumental in helping our company and many others build out the rural infrastructure, as well as the State of Maryland and the Maryland Broadband Cooperative, two critical partners in our ability to bring rural high-speed internet service. I'd like to share with you our experiences and lessons learned as a small rural ISP. First, I think it's clear that the only way that rural America will cross the digital divide is through a sustained public investment on the local state and by the local state and federal governments. Without public investment, rural high-speed internet companies will be limited in their ability to grow and sustain service over the long term. If a rural community has a higher percentage of uncertain households, the need for public investment is even greater. I want to applaud the FCC 
for moving forward with the Connect America Fund II reverse auction to allocate up to $2 billion for rural broadband this year. This will be a very critical and important step to help the build out of the infrastructure. Without public investment, the case for private investment in rural broadband is extremely difficult. Capital expenditures are very high, and revenue and subscriber base is low. This market structure is very unfavorable to traditional debt financing, and there is a limit to the amount of equity financing that a small business can accommodate. This is why public investment is so essential. Each community needs a customized solution because each rural area is different. Small rural ISPs understand and know the territory they operate in and are able to customize solutions that both work from a technolo technologically as well as from a business standpoint. Second, any federal strategy to expand rural high-speed internet service must focus on the last mile, that part of the network that actually brings service directly into the home and business. Previous public investments focused heavily on the middle mile, that fiber or cable under the county road or county highway. And after a decade or more of public and private investment in the middle mile, we believe the federal government should focus now how to monetize that investment and actually provide service into the homes and businesses. These rural communities have paid for this infrastructure through their tax dollars, and we believe it's time they actually get the service from it. Federal funds should be used also to encourage local and state governments to adopt comprehensive last mile strategies that work with local internet service providers that combine both middle mile and last mile solutions into a sustainable and affordable solution for high speed internet service to rural communities. Onerous um, financial requirements for accessing federal funds should be revised. These onerous requirements, such as large lines of credit, as Ms. Fitzgerald mentioned, arbitrary operating margins, debt to equity ratios, are not always the most important criteria in assessing an ISP's viability, nor do they offer much guidance in judging future performance. Instead, emphasis should be on past performance metrics and not exclusively on traditional financial metrics. Access to uh, spectrum is another issue that was mentioned that is also critically important. Our company uses licensed spectrum and it makes a huge difference in the quality of our service and the coverage area that we're able to achieve. Um, we hope that the FCC has mentioned, both Mr. Donovan and Ms. Fitzgerald mentioned that access to the spectrum, a dedicated spectrum um, for the rural ISP such as Blue Surf is very, very important. Finally, I think there should also be a mechanism to share um, information on, between the federal government and ISPs on things such as cybersecurity. Um, oftentimes, small companies like ours who are critical network operators don't always access the latest uh, information or data when it comes to cybersecurity, and having a formal mechanism with federal agencies to do that to keep us up to speed would be very, very helpful. Um, access to affordable internet service is critical for all rural communities to attract jobs, improve education, and provide basic services such as medical care. Rural ISPs are at the forefront of this, and we local companies are enjoying um, great popularity as we expand our service. And with our companies like ours, there's a multiplier effect in the communities that you don't have with the large national carriers. We hire local companies, local contractors, sales and marketing people, and there's a multiplier effect in communities with companies like ours that simply is not always there with some of the larger companies. Finally, I encourage federal agencies to adopt policies and encourage incentivize rural internet service providers to invest and grow in, in the marketplace and work with companies like Blue Surf to expand that coverage. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Carliner. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. Owens, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman uh, Radwagon, uh, Chairman Blum, Ranking Member Lawson, uh, Ranking Member Snyder, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Derek Owen, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs and Industry Affairs for WTA Advocates for Rural Broadband. WTA represents more than 340 small rural telecommunications providers from across the country. Our members provide voice, broadband, and video-related services to some of the most high, rural high-cost areas in the nation. Imagine having to provide communication services to 3,900 subscribers across 3,200 square miles. This is the reality for Golden Belt Telephone Association based in Rush Center, Kansas. Why do small companies build in these remote areas? Because decades ago, larger providers didn't build there because it was too difficult to make a business case to do so. This is the reason why small rural local exchange carriers, Arlex, came into existence and why without them, rural America would be left behind in this digital age. I'd like to highlight a few areas <clears throat> where policymakers can make a difference when it comes to helping our member companies deploy broadband in rural America. First, there must be stability and predictability with the Universal Service Fund. The Communications Act requires universal service support to be sufficient and predictable. In 2011, the FCC adopted two, 
adopted a $2 billion budget for ARLEX, uh, the ARLEC portion of the USF High Cost Program. To remain under budget, a budget control mechanism was adopted that reduces support automatically if the budget is, ex is exceeded. While the FCC approved several other cuts and constraints, the BCM, as we call it, is probably the most onerous. Last year, a WTA member testified before this committee about the importance of USF and how the frozen support level, uh, as well as the cap on the high cost program and the imposition of the BCM was making it difficult to invest. In the last year alone, a member company in Kansas and one in Illinois have seen their USF support reduced by over $400,000 and $800,000 respectively respectfully because of the BCM. These are just two examples. There are a couple more in my testimony. These unpredictable year-to-year -year support reductions are certainly proving to disrupt and discourage investment. We're beginning to see a change in that direction, however. A proposal by FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has, uh, before his fellow commissioners is a step in the right direction, in our opinion. It seeks to restore some of the cuts in USF support while asking important questions about the overall sufficiency and size of the USF budget going forward. We greatly appreciate the work several members of this committee have done to help us get us to this point. Point two, it's encouraging to see much attention being placed on rural infrastructure in Congress and within the administration. WTA supports the $20 billion that's called for in the February budget agreement, uh, and we support the $50 billion in the President's uh, infrastructure outline presented to Congress a few weeks ago. However, these proposals don't go far enough. There needs to be dedicated funding for rural broadband infrastructure. We should do more, we should also do more to ensure the broadband infrastructure needs in tribal areas are being met. WTA supports a proposal by the National Tribal Telecommunications Association that would increase an RLX USF high cost support if those companies actually serve tribal areas. We understand a variation of this proposal is being considered at the FCC and may be part of Chairman Pai's proposal. Finally, when it comes to government regulation, there is no argument that government needs to keep track of where and how federal funds for broadband and USF dollars are being used. The debate is not about regulation and reporting versus no regulation and reporting, but how much, how often, and what kind. Regulation can often be helpful when it comes to ensuring small businesses that lack market power can compete against much larger companies. For example, our members benefit from regulations requiring large providers to interconnect with smaller ones so our communications networks functions properly. Our member companies can also benefit from updated reg uh, video regulations. Again, at times, regulations can enhance competition. There's also the case that some regulations are unnecessarily burdensome. Several of our companies have analyzed how much time and money they spend completing filings for the FCC, RUS, and other entities, estimates that run around $80,000 to $90,000 annually. Environmental and historical preservation reviews are also costly and add significant costs for small businesses. While some rules, regulations, and reviews are necessary, others can be eliminated or reduced without any significant adverse to the public. For instance, all regulated telecommunications providers are required to complete the FCC's local competition and broadband report known as the Form 477, that's twice a year. The data are used to produce an annual report to Congress and to update the national broadband map. The FCC estimates the average company will spend 387 hours per semi-annual filing or 774 hours per year. WTA believes this proposal can be completed uh, with uh, annually. WTA has, been, WTA has been supportive of several bills that would provide regulatory relief to small carriers. For example, a bill introduced by Representative Curtis would expedite environmental reviews for broadband projects using existing operational rights of way on federal lands. Our member who testified last year had to wait nine months to get an environmental approval uh, to install fiber along a federal highway after receiving a federal stimulus uh, grant loan combo. Another company wanting to lay conduit along a Forest Service road was forced to pay for an environmental impact assessment even though the, route, the road is regularly repaved and the area around the road is sprayed with herbicide. 
These types of reviews add 18 to 24 months to the length and 10 to 20 percent to the cost of broadband projects. In closing, WTA members work hard and under difficult circumstances to bring broadband to their communities. Government has an important role to play here. Predictable support and smarter rules and regulations will help rural telcos put their limited resources to best use. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Now we'll begin the first round of questioning. I now recognize myself for five minutes. This question is for all the witnesses. What does it take for a small carrier to develop broadband in isolated areas such as American Samoa, Puerto Rico, the various islands of the Marianas, or some of the most remote parts of Alaska? These are places that you can't drive to, you have to take a boat or fly to. Well, Chairman, one thing that uh, is important in serving remote areas like Alaska, um, like, like uh, your home district is, is making sure that you have certainty around these timelines when you need to use helicopters and boats and, and other mechanisms that you don't need to, to use to deploy services in, in places like Washington, D.C. You need to be able to schedule that ahead of time. Um, this has really been seen with some of the recent natural disasters in several areas, including American Samoa, about how certainty about what you can do and when you can bring equipment in needs to be lined up with the permitting process and streamline that, especially as you're looking to expand coverage or restore service where it's been out so that you can actually provide service in some of these very remote areas where it's already very high cost to serve. Ms. Fitzgerald? I agree with that. I also think that, you know, we talked about the business case here, and in some of these very remote, very rural places, you know, you lack subscribers. There's not enough subscribers to make the business case. And so in that case, universal service is critical. Um, you know, adequate and uh, reliable universal service support is what makes or breaks those networks. Mr. Carliner? I, I certainly agree with that. And I think the that for a solution for an island, for example, is going to require a really comprehensive planning and bringing the stakeholders together. It's going to be a mix of technologies, a mix of areas and communities. And I'd say the most important thing from our experience is to make sure that the engineering and the technology matches with the business plan. They have to go together. And it's important that they fit together to make it affordable, to make it both sustainable as well as affordable for the community. So proper planning and bringing the elements together, technology and business and the stakeholders together is, is I think, the most important first step. Mr. Owens. Thank you. I would add um, that, again, uh, sufficiency and predictability and universal service is by far one of the biggest issues um, because those dollars are actually used to build networks. Uh, and without the underlying infrastructure in place, you're not going to get some of the other technologies that you would use to complement the services that you're bringing uh, to, to very rural and remote areas. Ms. Fitzgerald, can you discuss what geographic area size might be attractive to small and regional providers as they compete for spectrum at auction and provide some background on why the FCC may have chosen not to employ smaller geographic area licenses in past spectrum auctions? Sure. Uh, in terms of spectrum auctions, geographic license size is always uh, a point of contention, usually between large nationwide carriers and small rural providers. Um, RWA has uh, largely supported uh, an area called a cellular market area, or a CMA, uh, which is a subdivision. They, they go as large as nationwide, and they go as small as census tracts. So we tend to favor uh, sizes around the CMA area. Um, there are, I believe, a little over 700 of those nationwide. Um, we have also supported, uh, for instance, in the uh, current uh, CBRS proceeding, support county size or census tract license sizes. And generally, you know, if, if, if I'm a small carrier, I have a maybe a two or three county service area First of all, I can't afford a nationwide license. I can't even afford, you know, licenses significantly smaller than nationwide. I want a license size uh, that I can afford that I'm going to be able to utilize to provide support to these service areas and, and, a, and a license size that I can afford to build out. Obviously, there are build out requirements tied to licenses won at auction. So if you win one of those licenses, you need to be able to build it out. If I'm a nationwide carrier, you know, smaller licenses mean more administrative minutia. Um, 
and so uh, it also means you have to compete in more markets to win licenses to cover the territory you want to cover. So we support smaller license sizes because it uh, increases the number of bidders in an auction, um, and it doesn't depress auction turnout. Thank you. I'm running out of time here. So Mr. Donovan, what's your current view of the FCC's approach to mitigating overstated coverage areas on the broadband map? And can you elaborate on the disproportionate impact this might have on small carriers? Sure, thank you for the question. So uh, the, the map that's out right now for the initial eligible areas for Mobility Fund 2 was supposed to have a better starting point, looking more like coverage on the ground. I think uh, if, if you looked at the map, um, You'd be surprised, Dr. Marshall, that most of the big first has coverage of four megabit of four G LTE um, across of just about the entire district. Or um, Rank Member Schneider, that St. Elizabeth is served, and you have to drive hundreds of miles to find a dead spot based on this initial areas. Uh, the problem there is that if these areas are not challenged by a small carrier that wants to seek support in this area, and that means go buy a phone, go buy a plan, drive test it, submit that data to the FCC for the chance to participate in an auction. Um, which is costly in itself, then these areas we're going to keep going on marked as served and support will not be eligible for them. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Lawson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, and I'm going to start uh, with Mr. Owens. Uh, Mr. Owens, and, and, I, and I preface this by saying that I know that the administration and administration start uh, to uh, look at cuts that they can make in it. 2019 budget, uh, but uh, uh, the broadband cuts that uh, been uh, uh, sent is by 15 percent of uh, of the cuts to uh, 23 million, and the distant learning program, and then 10 percent uh, to 24 million. How would these cuts affect rural wireless carriers and uh, rural wireless uh, association that's recommended by the administration? So thank you for the question. Uh, our association, we, we represent the wired portion of, uh, of companies. Um, we don't necessarily uh, represent them on the wireless side, but I will say this. Obviously, the cuts in programs uh, are going to be extremely onerous on, on a, a company's overall uh, business opportunities, whether they offer just voice, landline, broadband, fixed service, or wireless service. Uh, so uh, the cuts, you know, I, we wouldn't be supportive of them uh, because if you're trying to get broadband out and, uh, you know, you're looking at all the modes and op ways to do that, um, you know, in some areas, wireless is going to be a complementary service to a fixed service just because uh, it's going to be extremely costly to try to wire an area uh, where if you can use wireless service to do so, uh, we see that as, again, a complementary service. So having cuts to that part of the program is not probably not beneficial. Okay. Mr. Carlina. I would agree, Mr. Chairman. I think that for many small um, rural ISPs, these grant programs are very important in helping them build out um, build out their networks. Um, and we certainly benefited from that in 2010. It was critical for us launching our network. And I think that for many other communities around the company uh, around the country, a sustained federal investment in these grant programs, even small ones, is really really important. People forget how sometimes how small these communities are and how small the companies are. Mr. Donovan. Thank you. So I, I think the a bigger point with, with your question that's important in the infrastructure debate going on right now is what kind of a country do we want to be? Do we want to be a country that has mobile broadband available across the entire nation, including these rural areas, or do we only want to focus on some and let some areas fall behind? Um, if we want to have service nationwide ubiquitous mobile broadband coverage, then we need to actually look at the problem and then size a solution to fit that and meet the needs. Small ISPs are going to be a critical part of serving that, but we need to take a step back and look at what the overall need is. Okay. I agree with the previous witnesses. I think that you know these broadband loan and grant programs are crucial. Uh, it's particularly true for small and rural companies because of the difficulties that they sometimes have in getting financing. And so these federal programs really meet a need um, that that doesn't get met anywhere else. Okay, and, and, and anyone can respond to this. Uh, I don't have much time. Uh, when the uh, the president recommend this, uh, giving to the state fifty uh, billion. 
uh, of the two hundred billion for infrastructure, uh, do you think that's that's going to all go to roads and bridges and so forth, uh, which is val it was really needed? How would that affect you? A anyone care to respond? If I may, uh, I definitely want to answer this question. Uh, yeah, we have a concern with uh, these dollars being block granted to the states. Uh, clearly, you know, there's some uh, states who may have broadband uh, operations or consortiums in the state that, that the governor could say, okay, these are going to be the folks who are actually going to uh, decide where our money goes. But we have a concern that, again, as I said in my testimony, rural infrastructure for broadband needs to be identified so that that doesn't happen, where those dollars don't go just for roads and bridges, but they actually do go to build rural broadband infrastructure. No one else? I got about 36 seconds. Sure. So uh, part of that is you know, recognizing, and we appreciate that the administration's proposal would allow governors to use up to 100 percent of those rural funds for broadband. Um, is that likely to be the case? Probably not, and we encourage that uh, for Congress to step in there and make sure that there are funds particularly dedicated for use of broadband purposes. I yield back, Madam Chair. I now would like to recognize Mr. Blum, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Agriculture, Energy, and Trade. Thank you, Chairwoman Radwagon. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize Chairman Shabbat, who is Chairman of our full business, uh, small business committee. Thank you for being here today. Mr. Carliner, in your testimony, you said in 2010, your company Blue Surf was awarded $3.2 million by the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, to do a project. In the next paragraph in your testimony, it says, and this is kind of unbelievable, you built the network on time and returned $1 million to the government. Yes. What went wrong? <laughs> <laughs> You're to be commended Thank you, sir. for returning $1 million. We, we don't often see that type of testimony. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll say that we were very fortunate in that um, we made a decision, um, and this is a, an example of how technology changes so rapidly. Our original design was a mix of Wi-Fi and WiMAX, but what happened is we, as time went on, LTE came out as a new standard for wireless communication. We re-engineered our network very quickly to adopt this new technology, and that helped lower the cost of our, of our network. And fortunately, with USDA's approval, they approved our redesign, and we ended up saving a million dollars to the government. We were very proud about that. Congratulations. You're Thank to you. be commended. Um, I just have a quick technological question before I get into the other questions I want uh, to ask you all. Mesh networks. I have heard about mesh networks. Mr. Donovan, you're, you're grinning. I mean, uh, and I know a little bit about them to be dangerous. Is, is this part of the solution? Is this, is, is this a, uh, you know, not going to be part of the solution as far as rural goes? So, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I, since we talked about this last year, I've gone back and made sure I did my homework before coming back <laughs> before you, uh, appreciating your focus on mesh networking. A lot of, uh, to have the mesh, you need to have cells close enough to each other. So in order to facilitate this, there really is a focus on streamlining deployment of small cells or smaller telecommunications equipment. Um, so that you can have overlapping areas. To do that, there currently are, are significant barriers to being able to deploy um, and that increase the cost, environmental review, et cetera. I think last time we talked about how you could deploy a small cell on the side of your house if, if you were mm -hmm. willing to go through an environmental assessment, a historical review, pay the associated fees, and you made it very clear that you were not going to do that. Uh, and that's the case facing carriers who are working to densify networks today. Is, is, is it a technologically limited type of an issue? Is it an equipment limited issue? Or do, in theory, does a mesh network make sense? So it, the in technology, theory, in, techno theory. in theory, I mean, the technology is evolving, and, and that is where we're going. Um, that you do still need to be able to bring that network back to uh, backhaul access to fiber. And so that depends on permitting on how many hops away you can get from that until you truly have a, a mesh network. It's an intriguing idea. That's why I ask. The hearing title today is Rural Broadband and the Business Case for Small Carriers, and uh, we get it. The business case uh, is not typically good. Uh, the income per square mile uh, when there's not a dense population is low, and the cost to get the service there because of uh, the, the square mileage we're talking about is high. Uh, typically not a good model for small business. So I have, I've only got about like a minute and a half here, but I'd like to get from each of you quickly. What is the number one thing that Congress can focus on to help make the business case for small providers uh, in rural areas? What's the number one thing we should focus on? 
I've talked plenty about USF, so I'll turn my attention to roaming. Data roaming is incredibly important, and uh, rural carriers are seeing their roaming revenues decline because the large carriers are simply unwilling to pay it. That leaves uh, nationwide customers often without service in rural areas, um, and it, it also impacts the rural carrier's ability to, to make a business case for serving their area. Thank you. Mr. Donnelly? So I think in rural areas, we're seeing an evolving business case. You're, you're hearing a couple weeks ago, I appreciated one of your witness compared farm ag tech to right now with the mobile networks that it rides on, on uh, driving a Ferrari down a gravel road. Um, that's not good enough. There's going to be new applications, particularly Internet of Things and, and narrowband Internet of Things in rural areas. Right now, the, the role for Congress is how do we make sure that we can do the if you build it side of the if you build it, they will come equation. Carliner. I would say, Mr. Chairman, the, the most, most important thing to be, to be able to do would be to use federal funds to provide direct grants for capital construction for the last mile. That's the most difficult uh, nut to crack in rural broadband. And if we had assistance, direct grant assistance to small rural ISPs to help do the construction element of the last mile, then you would make the operating plan uh, sustainable. Thank you. Mr. Owens? Mr. Chairman, I would say predictability and universal service, again, is important. Uh, our companies need that predictability and stability. Uh, the high cost fund needs to be, the size of it needs to be increased as well. Thank you. And my time has expired. I'd now like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Snyder, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks for your uh, testimony today and your perspective and insights on, on this issue. Um, I want to pick up a little bit on the, the mesh networks for a second and talk looking forward. Um, I think, Mr. Donovan, you mentioned just in passing 5G. Uh, 5G is not available today, but it is on the horizon. What will be the implications for 5G as we're looking at getting uh, broadband into rural communities? Sure. So 5G is not just one thing, which is it's so exciting about it right now that it's many things. And in rural areas, it's everything from precision agriculture to monitoring cattle on ranch lands to the ultra high speed, you know, distance learning and telehealth applications. All of those are built on 4G networks. So as we're talking about uh, policies to deploy 5G, uh, it's not just a future issue. This is something that we really need to focus on today. Uh, at CCA, we, we have a saying of you gotta keep up with your Gs as you go from 2G, 3G, 4G. And if we can't keep up with our Gs, then um, these rural areas will be left behind as, as we're in a global race for 5G dominance. Right. I also wanted Good to show. note Oh, pardon me. No, I said Ms. Fitzgerald. Uh, I also wanted to note, it's important to remember that, you know, 5G applications, these uh, small cell applications are very useful in certain applications. But I think the business case for 5G in rural America is still really evolving. You can't cover hundreds of thousands of square miles with small cells. It just, it, it doesn't work like that. So 4G, LTE, those LTE technologies are still incredibly important in terms of building out the wide spaces that, that exist in rural America. Well, I think it will be important as we move to 5G that that bridging technology is protected, or it, you know, and that's a role I think federal government will have a, a, a say in. But um, anyone else want to add? Yeah, but, um, Carliner. Jim, one thing I want to mention is that we currently have the ability, we have a, we're a fixed wireless provider, we, we're not in the mobile space, and we have the ability to deliver 100 megabits per second um, to a customer if they so desire. Even with that capability in our rural area, we have not had one customer come to us and ask for 100 megabit per second service. The vast majority of our customers are looking for 10 to 25 megabits right. per second into their, into their territory. So I think it's terrific to push the envelope of technology and, and to keep the rural areas with their urban suburban counterparts. But I would not want to see that come at the expense of providing um, much more affordable basic service to people who need it. 25 megabits per second is, is a great, is a robust high speed capability of most homes and businesses. And that I think is the first hurdle we need, all need to meet before we leap too much into, into new technology. Thank you. All right, uh, again, picking on something that uh, Mr. Donovan said, uh, the, I want to get it right, the implication of rural communities falling behind. What are the implications? Because with each G, and after 5G, there may be 6G, uh, you know, Apple skipped 9G on their telephone, but technology is constantly moving forward. As that moves forward, without the investment, what happens to the communities, to rural communities? So you know, I'll pick up on a theme again that, that your subcommittee talked about a couple weeks ago in restoring rural America, that it's not only important for some of the ag tech and uh, exciting innovations that are taking place on, on farmlands and ranchlands in rural areas. It also has to do with the, the quality of life where you have uh, 
you know, families and individuals that, that want to be able to participate in modern economy, but also want the qual quality of life of growing up where, or staying where they grew up and raising a family there. Um, being able to connect them means that it's not only about the farms and ranch lands, but it's about everything else that goes on in those communities. I'll give you two anecdotal examples in the area we serve, um, which is uh, we've been told that by economic development uh, officials in one of the counties we serve, there was a company wanted to build a warehouse facility and bring jobs to that particular county. When they found out they was not have the internet service they required, um, that was the deal breaker. They would not sure. they would not invest there. The second example is we've heard from um, actually from real estate agents in our in some of our territory that the biggest barrier to selling a home in these areas now is lack of high speed internet to the home. If there is no internet service to the home, the property values actually decline and the homes takes much longer to sell the home. Uh, okay. Ms. Fitzgerald. I also, in my testimony, mentioned you know this move from 2G and 3G voice service to 4G LTE. I mean, this is a change that could really decimate voice roaming in areas, which means that if you're not, if that's not your home carrier, you may not have voice service, you couldn't make a, an emergency phone call. It, 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 we want to make sure that the level of service is preserved as these technology uh, technologies move forward. Right. And in the last couple of seconds, half minute I have, uh, it also affects education, telehealth, things that are moving throughout the country will affect uh, rural communities if they're left behind, will make it harder for people to go back home, as you said. Uh, I think it's important that we maintain that. And Mr. Carlin. I will say there's one, we have one school district where uh, in area near where we serve where the kids at night get, their, their parents drive them to the parking lot of the school at night to get the free Wi-Fi because they don't have internet service at home and they do their homework in the car in the parking lot. Yeah. Well, thank you with that. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. I'd also like to mention that Mr. Snyder is the ranking member on our subcommittee on agriculture, energy, and trade. I'd now like to recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Curtis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we know a little bit about rural in Utah. And I'd like to thank uh, our witnesses for being here today. Mr. Owens, you were kind enough to refer to my Rural Broadband Permitting Efficiency Act of 2018. And I'd like to just go back to that for just a minute. Uh, is it your experience uh, that federal reviews and permitting requirements are a major challenge, and, and especially if you think about the West, where um, I have some counties that are 90% federal land? And, and would you mind just expressing your opinion on that, and, and will this bill help? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we believe this bill will help expedite the processes, um, as you alluded to, and as I indicated in my testimony, we had some some of our members, it took many, many more months and almost a couple of years before they could actually get a project approved. So we think this will be helpful uh, going forward. Um, we do want to talk a little bit more about the state permitting uh, authority uh, to understand that a little bit more, but we ultimately believe the, the bill is, is, is a good one. Thank you. Um, I, I must admit, as I listened to the four of you, I, I formed a picture of David and Goliath in my mind. And you must feel at times as if you have little pebbles, uh, right, that you're uh, throwing at this uh, big monster. I guess one of the questions I have for you is, um, can we get there from here? And you've got some fundamental uh, building blocks. You've got uh, subscriber revenue. You've got the uh, USF fund and re roaming uh, revenue. Y you've all brought up some flaws, especially with the latter two of those. and. Are you comfortable that we have the model in place uh, to help you be successful? Mr. Donovan, you're ready to answer that question. Yeah, so um, I think if you set the right policies, then, then David's got a fighting chance here. Um, with respect to your bill and your work with Senator Hatch on this, thank you for those efforts. Um, one of our, our members, Union Wireless in, in Wyoming and parts of Utah, uh, when I visited them last summer on their yard, they had rows and rows of conduit that were waiting to go in, um, that were waiting to bring service to cell towers that will bring LTE service. But because of federal permitting to deploy this fiber along a highway, uh, the conduit was just sitting there in their yard. Um, so some of these policies to streamline deployment, uh, you know, if I can leave one point, it's that it's not only talking about downtown urban areas, that it's critical to providing service in all of these rural parts. And that oh, with regard to your bill especially, that being able to deploy the fiber assets is a critical part of the wireless delivery that mm -hmm. consumers enjoy today. Good. I'll echo that, and uh, Union Wireless is also a member of ours, so uh, they are well represented here. But um, I think streamlining, permitting, 
all of those issues are tremendously important. And let's not forget the cost that goes into what, you know, they have the spectrum, they're paying for the spectrum, they have, you know, all of these plans, and they're just waiting to put them in place. And so the costs involved with, you know, the permitting process and the waiting is just, is tremendous. And so to the extent that, um, that we can move that process along, and I think your bill is helpful in doing that, um, more the better. Thank you. Ms. Fitzgerald, you talked about letters of credit. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that anybody that um, put a requirement for a letter of credit in has never had to uh, apply and get a letter <laughs> of credit. Um, so I would just like to take this time to emphasize your point that that is hugely problematic. Oftentimes when we require a letter of credit, it takes the same capital to hold that letter of credit, credit that we're asking for. Yep. And so uh, no doubt, um, very problematic. I'd also highlight, uh, like to highlight and emphasize a point that at least two of you made, maybe more, that we have a flawed map. And um, I, I don't know if any of you would like to, to revisit that again and, and talk about it. I know, Mr. Donovan, you talked about we're stuck with this for 10 years. And if we have a model that is tough enough as it is for you, uh, right, and then we introduce uh, something that uh, is, is a flawed map that makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible, for, for some of you to be successful, where do we go with that? So, uh, I don't know if Please. the question. Please. Mr. Owens and then Mr. Donovan, if you'll follow up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we actually uh, polled our membership um, after the map came out and asked them what were some of the difficulties or if the map was actually accurate. And we got from a, a good number of our folks saying the service areas were highly inaccurate, uh, the map wasn't accurate. Uh, the map didn't reflect the most recent broadband uh, bandwidth increases uh, that they had had or their fiber to the home locations. We believe the map is important and, it, and you need to have a map to show where service is. But again, with the 477 data, uh, that needs to be updated and used uh, more, more uh, yes. have more accurate data there. Mr. Donovan, I'm out of time, but l let me just end my comments with a big exclamation point behind your concerns and, and uh, let's make sure this hearing recognizes that that is a major problem. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. I now recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Marshall, for five minutes. Okay, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Owens, you mentioned Rush County, Rush Center, uh, Kansas, and I think sometimes we just don't paint a good picture. I think most of us understand why the people in Rush County, Kansas need internet, high-speed internet access. Why does the rest of the world care? Why would the rest of the world care about Rush Center? And, and two businesses come to mind there. One is the Mid-State Farmers Co-op in Rush Center, and one is the Lacrosse Livestock Market. Why would the rest of the world even care? I, I think that they understand. I can paint this picture that I need a train to get those goods to the to 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 California and then ship to Japan who pays a premium for this good Kansas beef we have and and everybody wants our high protein wheat as well so why would the rest of the world even care that we have high speed internet in Kansas in rural America yeah dr marshall thank you for the question um because it could mean again i think as mr donovan said it's a quality of life you don't have to move to a city in order to to live out on a farm. Uh, you can sell your products and goods across the world, not just locally. Uh, and you can do it at a cost that's probably much cheaper than actually going and having to, to, to do this in an, in an urban environment. So those are some of the reasons why uh, it's important to have high-speed broadband connectivity in these uh, rural areas. Yeah, and Mr. Donovan, I know you've got some quite a presence as well in my uh, district as well. And trying to understand your map, I was looking at the little map you were talking about, but kind of does it drive the cost down for consumers, that, that the fact that La Crosse, Kansas has high-speed internet, I hope? So I, I think you're right in talking about how the, the world wants the products that, that are created in Kansas. Um, and you know, a lot of these products are more efficient. We talked a little earlier about how um, you can have higher yields and use less resources if you have precision agriculture technology. There's a lot of focus now on self-driving vehicles. Well, rural America has had those for years. They're just made by John Deere Case and, and others. Um, <laughs> those don't work if you don't have the mobile network that actually provides them. 
that then in turn leads to greater productivity, drives down the cost for these goods for consumers all around the world while also increasing profitability for your constituents. Yeah, so describe for the world that doesn't know what today's farmer looks like, how technologically dependent they are. You know, a farm that used to have, maybe it would take 20 or 30 people to run it, now it's got one or two. What's, what's today's farm look like? I mean, today's farmer is more of an agriculture engineer than what you think of, of uh, you know, blue jean wearing out in, in the field. Um, everything is connected. And if you don't have the network that powers those connections, everything from soil monitoring that you can now have an application that ties together the seeds that you have in the ground with the weather forecast telling you how many pounds of products you need to put on what parts of your farm, because rain's coming, you're not going to be able to get there. Um, how do we make sure that that's available to today's farmers so that they can continue to compete in a global economy? Right. And you know, I know my farmers are... are so ecologically minded today, and they always have been. They've been the greatest caretakers of, of, of Mother Nature. And as we have water conservation issues going on in Kansas, we and we try to protect the environment by putting less fertilizers on. Uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, do you want to talk a little bit of how does the farm today's farmer use technology to, for water conservation and, and maybe decreasing the inputs, not just to drive the cost down, but also to help ecology? Sure. I, you know, we say that uh, supporting rural America strengthens all America, and I think that's especially true when it comes to the, the case for um, ag tech and things like that. I mean, certainly anything that, you know, those farmers out there can use to make them more efficient and, and certainly, uh, you know, take steps to, to preserve um, the land. I think that they're more than happy to do so, but they need the connectivity to do it. And I'll remind uh, the committee that, you know, those connections don't occur right next to the road all the time. And so it's really important that those networks spread, you know, into pastures, into fields, and are able to connect with with uh, the machines that are available out there. Yeah, I, I shared this story before, but my mother was raised on a farm where she was the last farm on a dead-end road and didn't have electricity until eighth grade. And I'm just trying to imagine what that farm would be like from a production standpoint without electricity. And this is the 21st century last part of, you know, getting electricity that last farm. And we're, we're blessed to live in a country where we spend 8% of our uh, domestic product on groceries, on food. Uh, we're, we're most most, uh, most world leaders are spending 18 25%. And I can't help but think that this high-speed Internet is, is part of that solution to why we, we can do that. Uh, Mr. Carlin, you want to add anything to that? Give you a no question. Open in in our in our service area, uh, Dr. Marshall, we have the Delmarva area is a large poultry processing, poultry growing region, and one of our we've heard from poultry processors and farmers who are desperate for high speed internet for remote sensing, monitoring chicken houses. Farmers are one a group that demands the internet more than any other group. I think in our area, we hear from farmers all the time for precision agriculture, monitoring, remote sensing. It's as important to them now as you just mentioned as electricity in the 1930s and then phone service, internet service is a critical utility to farmer today as anything I, I can imagine. Yeah, and for the record, it was the 1940s. I want to make my mom older than she is. She's going to turn 80. Let me see, what is today's date? I think it's t tomorrow or the next day, whenever March the 8th is. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Marshall. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My first question is for Mr. Donovan. Uh, you described in your testimony, recent actions by policymakers to alleviate some of the administrative burdens to deployment of rural broadband. Are there administrative burdens that policymakers have not yet addressed? Thank you for the question. And, um, you know, there's a cable setting. It's, it's an important issue for all carriers recently. Uh, a group of uh, the leaders from several of my members, 24 non-nationwide carriers, including Bluegrass Cellular in, in your district, um, weighed in on just how important this is. Now, I, it's, it's spring training, so maybe I'll take it that it's maybe we don't need to swing for the fences and hit a home run. We can score a lot of runs with, with singles, and so where the FCC can act this month to start streamlining that process, they should. Uh, where there's other spaces for Congress to act, like some of the bills that we've discussed today, that that's another great opportunity. There are several pain points. On, so. We've prepared a, a flow chart that's going to be way too small for you to see on all the steps to support to right. site infrastructure. I, I'm happy to provide it for the committee. Um, all of those are pain points that there's opportunities for relief from policymakers so that we can actually spend these dollars and time on getting uh, broadband out into, into your communities instead of spending it on a team of lawyers in D.C. and trying to ma navigate through this maze. Good, good answer. Mr. Carliner, uh, 
from your perspective as co-founder of a small internet service provider, can you walk us through your calculus as you determine whether the business case is strong enough to justify deploying broadband in rural high cost areas? Um, yes, sir. When we look at an area where we're going to deploy internet service, two things are critical, three things. The first is what ex infrastructure already exists. Do we have access to a fiber network somewhere? Are there existing tower assets uh, somewhere? And finally, what is the population density? And we match the cost of the capital cost of construction versus what we anticipate um, the revenue stream will be. We, we assume a very low penetration rate, a very low subscriber rate. So we have to make the case each site to be sustainable and profitable for each tower, each site. And if we're able to do that, uh, then we will go ahead and make that investment. But we make that calculation literally per tower, per site. Let's see. At, at what point are the costs too high to justify investing in these rural areas? I think it goes back to sort of the long term of the return on investment and how long it takes to get that return on investment. If it's going to be many, many years to get that investment, we won't make, the, won't make that investment. We look for a return on investment that's reason, with a reasonable time frame that we can support. And that, and that really is the issue. It's the time and the return on the investment. Let, let me follow up. This will be my last question. What happens if you are unable to offset your expenditures? If we can't offset our expenditures, then we'll probably have to shut down that site. It simply costs us too much money. It, it's, a, it's a loss, so we would probably be in a position where we would eventually just turn off the site and not provide that service. Have you ever had to do that? Um, thus year? far, fortunately, we have not. Uh, but there were cases where we almost did, um, and it would have been a mistake, but we're very, very careful in how we, in how we do that. We, we were careful in our business plan that we made the case to USDA and to others that our goal is not necessarily to cover 100% of a territory or a county, but to cover 80% of the population, and that's a critical difference. There, When you start with that basic, you make it affordable. If you try and cover an entire territory on a map, that less 20% blows your business case. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Comer. Uh, before I give my closing statement, I just have I have one further question. Uh, Dr. Marshall uh, took one of my questions about the importance of rural broadband for ag, uh, and uh, that's a good good question. I would I would like to have whoever feels qualified to, uh, to to give an answer to how important is rural broadband. Tell the rest of the country here in terms they can understand for health care, and where do you see? telemedicine, where do you see the, the healthcare market going? Because in rural rural counties, and I have 17 of, them, of my 20 counties are rural, uh, folks have to drive a long way to receive uh, healthcare. Veterans have to drive a long way. And just, just in layman's terms, how, how important is rural broadband to the healthcare market? I think it's tremendously important. You see uh, rural markets that have a difficult time attracting and retaining healthcare professionals. So to the extent that you can do you know, video exams for minor cases, to the extent that you can uh, utilize that technology to help folks that have a difficult time making you know, sometimes very long trips, it's tremendously important and it helps, uh, it helps keep costs down as well. Mr. Donovan. And just to add on to that, that um, it matters just it, in the day-to-day -day as well. An important aspect of, of telehealth is some of the monitoring programs. And one of our rural carriers that serves Sunflower County in the Mississippi Delta has already saved the state Medicare program hundreds of millions of dollars from a remote diabetes monitoring program that has reduced the need to go visit hospitals and is in trans transforming these patients' lives. So it's, it's important. Where's that at, Mr. Donovan? In what? Sunflower County in the Mississippi Delta. Um, not a heavily has, has saved how much? Has saved the state of Mississippi over $100 million so far just on monitoring. Um, so there's, these are real dollars and, and real changes in patients' lives. The, uh, the comparison to electricity is, is an adequate one, that, um, and one that the CEO of Qualcomm had made earlier this year, that 5G is going to be just as transformational as, as electricity or the automobile. Um, that means that it affects every other industry that it touches, including health care. So it's that important to make sure that these areas have access to these services. You're right. That, that is real money, <laughs> even in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I would Mr. also remember that it's also important, but people don't realize in urban areas how important rural areas are in this, in this field. For example, there are, um, in being in a rural area, they, it allows us to be a test bed for new technologies and new approaches that you simply can't do in an urban area. For example, in our lifetime, we're going to see drones um, become regular parts of our, of our lifetime. Drones going to need um, networks to connect to, and I think ur rural areas are going to be the test beds for, for drones and for this new world and the IoT and Internet of Things, that rural areas provide great test beds, telemedicine, telelearning, 
approaches and technologies and services that can be validated in a rural area that don't lend themselves to the urban area first. So I would say to folks who are living in the cities why rural areas are so important is because a lot of the technologies and services that have just been talked about start in the rural area first mm -hmm. and then are adopted in the urban area. Interesting. I would, I would agree uh, exactly with that point. Um, our companies are definitely innovators. Uh, they bring a lot of these new technologies to life early on, and then they get expanded upon and made better when they come to the city. So I, I would totally agree with that. I would also add that it's important that we talk about fiber building uh, in order for these services to work, especially for medical. When you talk about digital imaging and things of that nature. You need fiber in the ground uh, in order for those pictures and those diagrams and, and x-rays and things of that nature to actually go as quickly as possible because in many instances you may have life or death uh, circumstances. And I'm sure you probably remember when AOL first came out how long it took for you to actually download a picture. With fiber, you're able to now do that instantaneously. So I don't want us to lose sight that you need to have a fiber backhaul and fiber in the ground to make even medical uh, imaging work properly. Thank you very much for those insightful answers. I'd like to recognize Dr. Marshall for as much time as he may well, need. Well, thank you so much, Chairman. I just, my eyes lit up to talk about telemedicine and how important this is. I uh, represent 63 counties. I think I've been to every hospital. People often ask me, what, what are rural hospitals of tomorrow going to look like? And they're going to be centered around this emergency room. If you think about a rural health care, you think about trauma, and you think about strokes and heart attacks. Those are probably the three main reasons that people come to a health care facility in a rural community. Colby, Kansas, Citizens Hospital. Uh, little Colby, Kansas, but they're, they have an ER that's connected 24-7 to a trauma center. And we now have heart protocol and stroke protocols in place. So when a person presents, it's so important in that first 30-minute window to give them a, a blood thinner, a TPA's drug uh, that can literally save their life. And it's going to, from a healthcare cost efficiency, if you prevent that stroke, think how much stroke patients cost to rehab. And, and they spend maybe 60, 90 days in a hospital and then months in a facility. So having access to that inner, and, and just having a nurse on the other line 24-7, there's big complications from TPAs. You don't want to give it to the wrong patient and have them bleed out on you. And then the second thing I'm seeing is just incredible is in the veterans' health. We have a mini, a mini bus that goes from community to community, stopping at state fairs, focused on veterans' health issues. And they're able to hook up with telemedicine back to the VA center where the psychologists or the psychiatrists are, the counselors. We're losing 22 veterans a day to, su to, to suicide. Those folks aren't going to drive 300 miles to the VA center from rural America. This is a, a minivan going out to them and, and asking how they're doing. Uh, when it comes to telemedicine, what special needs are there for this minivan versus the ER ver uh, versus the what, what maybe what a, a farmer? Is it the same needs or is it different? I think in many ways it's the same. I mean, anytime you're you're doing sort of real time, you know, video, you need you need a strong mobile network, particularly in the vans that you mentioned. You know, they may be parked in a parking lot somewhere, so you really do need you know strong download and upload speeds, strong network to 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 convey that real time back and forth data. I mean, that's that's the trick. Yeah, the real time is the thing. I don't quite understand what that would take, Mr. Donovan. I, mean, I think the one biggest distinction between when you're at a, a fixed location like a hospital versus the van is by its very nature it's mobile and so you need access not just to the, the strong fiber connections but to strong enough mobile signals that you can actually still maintain that connectivity whether you're using well over the wireless network um, you're not going to be able to drive very far if you have to haul the fiber behind you as you're driving around the state. We try to. Mr. Carliner. Yeah, I, I would agree and, and also I think the um, we're living in a world where wearable technology now, the wearable devices is going to put further and further pressure and also great more opportunities. Um, yes. As these devices become better and better, the need for that connectivity with hospitals is going to be even more important. So I think the technology is going to almost drive the demand for these services even more than it is than it is right now. And even more critical, we have a, um, we serve an island in the middle of Chesapeake Bay. Um, and before we were able to get internet service, they had no connectivity. So now they have connectivity, it makes a big difference to be able to have a telecom 
conference with a local hospital than have to get in a boat in the middle of winter and cross that bay. So um, there are thousands of other examples like that around the country. Um, but, but the wearables technology, I think, is going to drive this demand even more. Sounds great. Mr. Owens, what's going on in my district with health care and telemedicine that you know about? Um, I, I, unfortunately, I can't comment too much on that. But I know, uh, you know, Golden Belt Telephone is doing its best to make sure that the hospitals are connected with fiber connections uh, and working with other carriers to make sure, as you heard Mr. Donovan say, uh, ensuring mobility as well. Yep, they, do, they all do a great job. I, it, all the carriers, the rural carriers, just are very committed to doing the right thing, love working with them, think that they, uh, their heart's in the right place. We just have to empower them to do their job. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Now to now I'd like to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Lawson, for as much time as he may take. I won't take too much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Donovan, there are numerous uh, recommendations for promoting broadband infrastructure uh, uh, deployment that we discussed today, and then there are many, uh, many have proposals to create new federal programs in various departments to make capital available for broadband infrastructure. What are your views on these uh, proposals, and are any better suited to address uh, the needs of rural areas? Thank you for the question. I, I think part of it goes back to making sure that agencies that have uh, an understanding of how these carriers operate and where service is available is, is a fundamental part of it. Um, that is, of course, you know, premised on having accurate data available to those agencies. So with any funding coming available, um, you know, there is not enough universal service fund support, just full stop, but for any of the programs, I think my colleagues on the panel would agree with that. Um, anything to provide additional resources to those carriers is important. We also, in that same vein, um, the Universal Service Fund is not an appropriated uh, budget item, and we, we don't want it to become one. Uh, it's hard to build out with the certainty that you may have through a couple-week continuing res resolution um, that you need to have long-term certainty in order to deploy in these networks. It goes back to in Congress creating the fund. Congress directed you know, reasonably comparable services, and we've heard before today with sufficient and predictable support. Um, so how can we make that sure that that happens? Okay, anyone else care comment on that? I would just add, obviously, any monies that are appropriated should uh, be targeted uh, to make sure that um, we're able to, to, again, make the most use of those dollars in building out the networks and using those dollars to, to work with the Universal Service Fund. As Mr. Donovan said, it's not appropriated dollars for USF, but any appropriated dollars that do come, uh, I think it would help uh, you know, make it easier and better to, to build out additional broadband. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a in a very uh, rural community, and uh, when I was a kid, you know, uh, my brother and I was fascinated when electricity finally came. And when the light came on uh, in the area, uh, we stayed up all night trying to see when it was going to go out, you know, because <laughs> we had never seen it before. Uh, in the rural area now with broadband, uh, kind of reminds me of uh, people who don't have access, you know, that uh, how extremely important it was for us, you know, to get electricity because they didn't bring it out there. It was the rural electorates who uh, tried to bring it out there. Do you, stay a, do you see a similar type situation, you know, with broadband in the rural areas uh, similar to what I'm t speaking of? So you know, we hear time and time again from customers served by rural wireless carriers how uh, it's, it's a breath of fresh air when you go from having unreliable mobile broadband coverage or constant dead spots to being able to seamlessly connect. So I think that, that experience is, is being enjoyed now. We need to make sure that more and more Americans are able to have that breath of fresh air. I agree. It's it really is a matter of quality of life. It's you know your kids being able to do their homework. It's you being able to you know be driving on a on a road at night and and calling nine one one if if you need to. It's it's about public safety. It's about all of those things. Starting a small business. Um, it, it's really about the quality of life that that uh, we want our citizens to have uh, throughout the country and also in rural areas. And also, um, uh, Mr. Lawson, we found that even in areas where there was no internet service, people were using their cell phones. 
and their cell phone bills every month were $400, $500 a month because they were blowing through their data limits because they had no other alternative. When high-speed internet arrives, that goes down to $40 or $50 a month as opposed to $400 or $500 a month. So there's real even immediate impact even beyond the, the, the need um, for the service itself. Yeah, I would add uh, that as wireline uh, broadband providers, our carriers, when they get um, a certificate area for service, they have to serve that whole area. Uh, so they just can't pick and choose where, they, where they're going to serve. And we have ca carriers who are saying they're most, their customers at the at far extreme of their service territory are extremely happy when they get broadband. It may not be the full 25-3, it could be 4-1 or 10-1, but they're extremely excited once they get it because they've not had it before. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. You may not have had electricity, but I'll bet you had a basketball hoop. <laughs> I'd like to thank our witnesses today for your excellent testimony. Uh, make sure you stay in touch with the members of this community because I think everyone would agree it's the most important uh, issue, especially for those of us who represent rural counties. We've heard today just how difficult it can be for small rural carriers and new entrants to maintain a viable and sustainable business. As with any small business, access to capital and adequate financing is a key to stability and success. We're reminded that should these carriers become unable to sustain their business models, the outcome most likely would be disastrous. The end result is that our communities and our citizens located in these high cost rural areas pay the price. The path to a comprehensive infrastructure plan should include solutions to improve rural broadband and fair competition for our small carriers. Our family farms, our rural entrepreneurs, small towns, and the next generation of innovators depend on it. I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered, we are adjourned. <laughs>